Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear me? Perfect. Yep. Yep. I see Guangzhou Long Lions background. Yeah, I, I don't have a cool background. Half these other people have, and and I, I'm I'm in this small flat in Belgrade, so I, I don't want people looking <laughs> at my kitchen. So I'm I'm sitting on the floor, and it looks like I'm in Guangzhou. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, familiar with these Chinese gyms too. And you, for how long? Have you, what, what's that? Uh, for how long have you been there in China? Uh, it's my second year. I don't know if I'm going to get back. I might have to work from them remotely. I've been locked out. You might have saw my story on the internet a little bit how I got locked out. I'm not sure, but it's been um like I said. It's been when you went for Chinese New Year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm still like I said. You know, the season's starting pretty soon, but I think I'm still locked out. So uh-huh you know <laughs> so it'll be interesting um I'm yeah i was in china as, i was in china as well for two and a half years uh so first i came there i worked for i'm not sure if you heard of a company it's named one ball so yeah, they, yeah. They, you're they out of beijing offer, right yeah beijing shanghai they're owned by ijan Lian and a couple other people and so I did uh, video breakdowns for NBA, uh, for NBA streams in China. Just kind of like if James Harden does a step back, I basically break down the step back, got a couple of exercises. And then the last, that was for, I want to say one year. And then by the time my contract was close to an end, I started working with Aaron Jackson. At that time, he was with Beijing Ducks. Yep. And so... The whole, all two years that he was with Ducks, I was with him basically. And then this year when he signed with Zhejiang. Yeah. Uh, I was traveling there too. And so, ah, so you were in Georgia, you were there. Okay. So we were there at the same time this year. Yeah. I was there only this year. I was only there in December. I came there for two weeks. And so we left right before all the all Chinese New Year and all the, all the stuff with pandemic. But before it was, yeah, we, we lived there. We lived in Beijing full time. And it was an amazing experience. Yeah. Um, I lived in Shanxi my first year. That was not an amazing experience. And then uh, I was in Guangzhou last year. So when we were in the main city, it was actually, it was, it was pretty nice, to be honest. Uh -huh. And the team, the Guangzhou team, they're located not somewhere outside of Guangzhou. Uh, team base is about 30k outside of Guangzhou, but when we're when we're playing during the season, we're pretty much in Guangzhou the whole time. So it's kind of nice. Okay. Okay. During the season's awesome, and the off season, um, I could do a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I bet that area when you are not during the games, the area of I think it's Foshan. That's how it's called. Yeah, yeah. That that's where our team base is. Yep. I think it's more more of a rural with little international places more like chinese yeah uh, you know what though when you say they're rural when, when you're in china it's still basically when you're in china it's still basically it's still a city of like five million so it's it's you know it's, it's <laughs> yeah not, it, it's not a it's not rural you know so it's when you when you look on the map but there'd be times there's a couple of the western coaches on every every weekend we'd go get a normal meal in guangzhou it was It'd be twenty dollars and be a forty-five minute taxi ride. It was well worth it. So we would do that two, three, two, three times a week. So. Mm -hmm. Got it. Well, hey, looks can like. You turn the, can you can you turn the screen sharing on? Yes. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah. yeah you, should, you should be able to do it now. Okay. So and while while you do that, I just wanted to welcome everyone for. Uh, I want to welcome everyone and thanks for joining us. Today we have a great speaker. His name is Adam Tatalovich. He's, as I remember, he's from Indiana, right? Yeah, born in Indiana, right outside Chicago. Yep, and with, with Serbian roots, he has worked in the NBA and he has been in Australia. He has been all over the world. And this year he was with Guangzhou Long Lines in Chinese Basketball Association. And so his topic is going to be on player development and self-scouting, as you can see. And now stage is on you, Adam. All right. So I appreciate you having me. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's awesome. All these, there's been so many uh, great global platforms to uh, watching, sharing, growing the game the last, uh, the last two months, pretty much. So it's, it's been fun. I've been watching uh, 
so, so many different um, great teachers, whether it's offensively, defensively, player development, leadership development. It's been, uh, it's been really good. Um, with that being said, I, I did one of these a couple of weeks ago for a, for a different platform. And I've tried to go outside the box. You know, we've been, um, I'm, I haven't been blessed to actually have like a lot of uh, in-game video to share people. And I didn't, I'm not one of those guys that's really comfortable sharing other people's playbooks and so forth. So mm-hmm. I kind of, I kind of try to take different angles of, how I view uh, player development, self-scouting, and so forth. Uh, the one I did a few weeks ago, um, I talked about um, player development with constraints because, you know, it's like one of the things I've noticed in basketball, a lot of times, you know, I- I've been spoiled. You know, I was in the NBA, you know, in and around 11 years, and you have so many different – you have so many baskets, balls, and bodies that um, a lot of times most people in the world, they can't replicate that environment. So – um, in, con- in conjunction with people having time, time constraints, uh, limited space, limited help, I've tried to kind of tackle it from that angle. Because um, like I said, you know, um, through all these platforms, most of the coaches that are probably on here have, you know, maybe they have one assistant, you know, and who knows how much practice time they have. You know, I'm, I'm sitting here in Belgrade, you know, I s- see a lot of teams practice every day and you know, they might have, they might have two hours and right after that, right after that two hours is up, you know, there's another there's another team entering the court. So, um, yeah, so it's been fine. But appreciate you having me and look forward to talking. Yep, yep. Glad to have you. And this, that's the biggest thing for me that now with most of the people being limited, they, can, they cannot travel and do all that. And seeing coaches able to share and really willing to share, it just, it just means a lot because we're basically helping the whole basketball community in the world. So if we go straight to topic, the first thing I wanted to ask you, uh, since we talk about player development and self-scouting, in your opinion, what are the main skills every guard needs to work on from a young age? You can name three, five, doesn't matter, that, that's up to you. Okay, so um, is my, my screen shared, correct? Mm-hmm, yeah. Yeah, so you know, I put here essential skills for guards. Um, you know, a lot of these are pretty basic, you know, um, you know shooting, you know, shooting cells when you're trying to make the team and, you know, shooting and scoring. So I'm always going to put shooting one. Um, shooting is always the thing that brings the most joy out of people. And as we all know, as coaches, you know, if you don't have um, a team that can shoot, um, us coaches got to be pretty creative in, uh, in some of our X's and O's and diagram and trying to hide that deficiency. So in terms of essential skills for guards, like I said, I mean, e- even for any player, I'm, I'm always going to put, you know, sh- I'm always going to put shooting first just because, you know, in order to succeed at the higher levels of the game, you know, you, you must be able to shoot and score the ball. So, um, you know, I, I don't put shooting one. Um, you, you'll see my essential skills for bigs in a, in, a, in a few minutes, but I think shooting and, and touch is really important. And um, we all know what, you know, what brings out the, pu- the pure joy of the game. And, and we can talk about different shooting mechanics all we want, you know, things that I always work on. You know, growing up in Indiana, we always talk about, you know, I always talk about elbows at the eyebrow. Um, mm-hmm. You know, your your guide hand is your. Uh, I, I, I had, I've stolen almost all my things with shooting. I've kind of mixed and mashed all these great teachers I've learned for the last twenty years. You know, I've t- always talked about the the guide hands, almost like the bookshelf. And like I said, you know, it's um, you know, I I, I don't I don't want to go really deep into into all all these different things. But like I said I think shooting's one and. And I think when it comes to shooting, I think it's getting those, those basic skills worked out when you're about to do, you know, when you're shooting and, and getting comfortable with your, with your form and your footwork before you start going outside. I mean, we, we see a lot of times you see a guy shooting, in the, shooting by himself in the gym and he just goes behind the three-point line and he's jacking up shots. So yeah. I'm not a real big fan of casual shooting. I like guys when they get into the gym, I like them to have a, a set routine when they get in there. Um, I, I, I call it my shooting ABCs, you know, activation, body and balance for B and uh, calibration for getting your distance. So, um, you know, I, I, same thing. I, I talked about this a few weeks ago. So when you're talking about shooting, I always talk about activation and that that's, you know, shooting form shots, whatever it's doing, whether it's, you know, 10 shots off the glass, 10 swishes, but I always try to get guys to make 50 to hundred shots before they even get outside the paint. You know, and then once I get past that, you know, then it's, it's body balance. You know, I talk about, 
you know, get, you know, uh, permanent pivot shooting, um, inside pivot shooting and, and, you know, getting all your different balances. You know, I'm, as I've been in Europe the last few years, there's, you know, I feel like Europe's excellent teaching, um, the balance aspect of it, of, of footwork and so forth. So, you know, going, moving on from there, I think, you know, ball handling is huge. Um, you know, if, if you're going to be a guard, you must be able to handle the ball. I think there's, um, you know, I, I don't have any secret sauce out there. You know, I think, I think two ball drills are excellent. Um, you know, you can, if, if you have somebody else, I think, you know, being able to handle the ball under duress is important. But like I said, you see so many guys now that um, you know, they can't handle the ball, you know, they can't handle the ball that well. And they're, they're looking down at it, you know, because we're talking about essential skills for, for younger players. So, when I think about, you know, when you ask me younger players, you know, like I said, it's, it's being able to like go down to the basics and like, you know, so like ball handling, you know, it's, I always do the same stuff. You know, I always, I always will start a guy stationary and I'll have him do, you know, two balls. And I, you know, I, I call it a, I call it shotgun when they're, when you're going back and down in a slow motion, then I call it machine gun when you're almost, you know, pitter pattering. And then, same thing with the right and the left. I'm always telling guys, you know, keep their hand up or keep their head up. I mean, I should say, and you know, a lot of us coaches, you know, we, we might hold uh, the different numbers up or you might hold a flash card up for the players or so forth. But I think getting players to see the floor and, um, you know, and, and getting themselves re you know, ready in that regard. So I think push pull dribbling, dribbling with protection. And like I said, you can go on YouTube and all these different skills, you know, skill development clinics all you want still this fancy uh ball handling but it's an essential you know next one is passing and this is one that's important and i i i, uh, I apologize i uh i get a negative check i think i uh, i misspelled one of those one of those but uh i'm passing i think there's two things that are important okay we can always say distributing the balls um you know it's easy and that's just an easy pass but i think receiving is almost more important um, and that's something I've kind of gained, especially coaching in Europe, you know, um, when you talk about distributing, which is just your, your normal passing, you know, we work on things, whether it's stationary passing, one hand, two hand. Um, I, I work with a lot of guards and I, I, and I love working on pick and roll type reads. And I've realized there's so many guards that when they use their off hand, they can't even execute a simple one hand hook pass or one hand, you know, one hand pocket pass. And I think those are things that really need to be worked on. Um, whether I'm working with a player who's 10 years old, 15 or 25, um, I'm always in my skill development sessions, you know, given that whatever you want to call them, supplements or vitamins, I'm always trying to get, you know, five, at least five reps from, from a player um, passing the ball off the move to different spots on the court. And I, I may, as a coach, I may move from two or three different spots and have that player working on them. Also, just that the, the one-hand push pass. It sounds like the most basic thing, but, you know, when you're, when you're watching basketball and a player's getting a uh, – you know, he's getting trapped, a lot of times they pick up the ball. They don't – you know, this goes back to the ball handling aspect. They're not seeing the floor – and their passing fundamentals are so low that, you know, if you're about to get blitzed by two defenders um, or trapped or whatever, whatever you want to call it, you know, you need to be able to see the five guys in the court, which is going to go back to the ball handling. With that being said, you must have all the different passing. You know, is, that, is it a one-hand push pass? Is it, you know, is it a hook pass? You know, is it a, is it a pivot? Is it a pivot, split, and, and pass out? So, like I said, I think, I think passing, you know, it's, it's easy to say, and, you know, you could sit there and work on all the one hand or, um, you know, one hand or two ball or two guy passing, but I think putting players in positions where they're on the court to actually do the passing, um, that's the most important. The next one is uh, receiving, and receiving is probably more footwork based than it is um, with the hands. So it's not just, okay, yeah, I can catch the ball with two hands. I always talk about, you know, catching it with your feet. Um, and I think that's most important. You know, if you're coming off the move, you know, I always try to teach inside pivot. So when you're, when you're coming off the move, is it an inside pivot where that inside foot, you know, I always tell guys when they're catching it to get shot ready or I call it the attack stance when a guy catches it, I always say, you know, 
heel toe toe. That's just me as a teacher. I always talk about that inside foot. It's going to be your heel toe, and then that other foot's coming around, and you know you're going to be able to turn your hips, and you're going to have m much better uh, base and balance on catching it, seeing the basket, um, or seeing a pass, or maybe going into a dribble move. So I think, um, you know, I think, this, you know, receiving is very important. Um, I don't like to mention other programs that I don't work with, but an example is I was blessed this year. We were playing some preseason games down in Philadelphia before this season, and um, I actually got a chance to uh, witness a Villanova practice, and they were t – all their players were um, – everything had to be a bounce pass in practice. Um, okay. I didn't, um, it, was, it was amazing. Like, I, at first I didn't notice. I, I didn't know why, and then I was able to spend some time with some of the coaches afterward and asking. But, you know, they said if, if you're constantly putting the players under, under that duress to have to make a bounce pass, once they go into a game and they're able to do any passes, they, uh, they feel the game better because they've been put in those situations. So, um, you know, like, like I said, I, I think creating those environments that, that put the players in a uh, – difficult um, restrictions to um, to do certain passes. I mean, you might say it has to be a bounce pass. You know, you may say it has to be, you know, it has to be all one hand pass, but I think putting players in those, uh, in those, those positions are important. And you know, just same thing with receiving, you know, I think receiving is um, important is more important because how are you, where are you catching the ball? Are you catching the ball 30 feet from the basket where you're not a threat? Um, and a lot of it's doing your work early. Uh, most, most coaches know, you know, you need to set up your defender before you catch the ball. Um, we all, we, we all been there when we see kids that are 12, 13, 15 years old, they, they just run to the spot. Very rarely do you see a guy doing a L cut V cut, putting his body in the defender's chest, um, engaging him before he gets open. So I think those little details are, you know, you know they're, they're the most important thing. So those are my three things. I think they're pretty simple, but um, like I said, I, I would, you know, I would really think about the passing one if you're a coach, you know, that is looking at, at, at my views is I think both passing the ball and receiving the ball out of a pass are, are really important that probably are not worked on as much as they should be. Mm -hmm. And I love the idea about all bounce passes in practice because that's one of the other things that I was also thinking kind of like you can limit the players in practice. For example, uh, I do that when we work on individuals. Uh, the players who are right-hand dominant, everything in the paint, they have to finish with the left hand. And so they get uncomfortable. They try to find the ways how and to do that. And it just – eventually you see that confusion on their face and you're like, okay – means that they're starting to think because it's not only physical pressure that you can put on them, but also kind of like mental or psychological. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's good you brought that up. And, I, you know, the, the whole confusion aspect and making guys think under duress, it's, it's probably the most I – mean, it's hard to replicate the game. And when you try to look for those little details, I always talk about shooting. My, my shooting workouts have changed – immensely since, you know, I started 15 years ago. I mean, I used to work with, uh, you know, I used to work with Tim Grover who had, you know, he had 25, 30 NBA guys. And I would always tell guys when we were shooting spot shots, I would always talk about um, make five, make 10, move to the next spot. And through spending a lot of time in Europe, um, having limited baskets, I've really gotten into, and you, I'm going to talk about this later, but I've always gotten into the precision aspect of shooting where, you know, you need to make five in a row, you need to make three in a row. And like I said, that level of confusion, um, it, it really, it, it's taxing on the mind in a good way where when the player gets in the gym in front of, you know, 1,000, 5,000 or 20,000, you know, you can, maybe it's, it, it helps you a little bit more replicate that, that same game pressure. The same thing with, um, you know, with ball handling. I think all coaches have done the, uh, you know, one dribble rule. Uh, two dribble rule, um, offhand rule. You know, uh, last year I, I led the development in the CBA, and for for three, we'd do three days of live work every day, and I would get I would be trying to be as creative as possible. I didn't want the players to get bored. You know, a lot of, in in, a, in Chinese basketball, it's almost a year round process. So I was trying not to. I didn't want it to be grueling or boring. So I think creativity is key. So. A lot of times with the ball handling aspect of what we're talking about, you know, I would say, you know, 
no dribbles. And, you know, I grew up in Indiana. I, I remember a lot of practices where, the, you know, the coach said no dribbles. And, and it's funny, as we're talking about ball handling and no dribbles, that puts so much pressure back to the passing, the, the receiving angle. You know, you must set up the guy in order to get the ball, you know. So they all go kind of hand in hand, but I like how you brought that up, though. But I think, you know, you know the, con- the confusion aspect, and so guys, can, you know, are uncomfortable is, is what us coaches want to do. You know, I, there's a good term one of my mentors uses a lot is, you know, you, you need to be, you know, you need to live in the uncomfortable. You know, when you live in the uncomfortable, it makes a lot of things easier as, as the game goes on. Yeah, that's for sure. And on shooting, you mentioned the ABC rule. So uh, activation, body and balance, and calibration, right? Yep. And like I said, that's just some, it sounds a little corny, and it's just something I've kind of came up with. But activation to me is, is working on form shots, whether okay. wherever you want to start the form. I've seen coaches say that they don't like form shots in the middle of the paint. They, they think more distance which is fine. Um, I always have my guys start in the middle of the paint and I might say, okay, I want 10 swooshes. Okay. And then I may say, I, uh, I call them butt downs, but I always tell a guy to drop down his hips, sorry, his hips and his ass down to the ground. I want him to pop the ball on the ground and I want him to finish on his toes. And then I'll go to inside pivot. And then, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll create different things. I may tell a guy, I want you to, um, you know, uh, five front pivots, five reverse pivots. And I'll just, I always will get 50, um, 50 makes inside the paint before practice starts. Um, if I'm uh-huh. running, my own pro- if I'm running my own program, I want my players, I-, I want them to have their own and it does not have to be boring, but I want to contour a, an activation for them, whatever they're comfortable with before they start going outside the paint. And, um, and I, I didn't say this, the first thing I have every single player do, no matter what age, is I have them do a series of Mikans because I think Mikan's good. It gets the ball in their hands. It gets the touch. The ball is going off the glass. It's getting their feet firing. So I'm always going to have a guy do a set of, uh, you know, he has to make 10 Mikans in a row from the front, at least 10 um, Mikans um, in reverse. So, you know, that's 20 off the bat. So I would tell any young player, you got you to make at least 10, if not 100 shots inside the paint in different forms before just to activate yourself before a, a, you know, a practice. Mm-hmm. And calibration, which one is that? It's when you have the- you know, calibration is my word for getting the distance down. So a lot of times what I'll do, um, I, I wish I had the video, but you know, I don't have it queued up, but I might have a guy start from two feet. And then he just t- he makes the shot. He takes a step back to three feet. Then he goes oh. back. He goes back again, and he has to make whatever it is five or six until he gets to the three point line. It may be something simple. You may tell with a with a younger player. I may say, I want you to focus. You must make three in a row from each position. But if you miss two in a row, you got to go back to the start. So I want to get a guy comfortable before he gets back to that three point line. Um, mm-hmm. I've seen some practices. I would say I've seen some high level practices that I've seen guys not re- do a casual shoot and they go into a practice. And before you know it, they're playing five on five. And I wonder to myself, like how many threes have they shot at all before they start shooting up in a five on five setting. So that's one thing that burns me up in my own personal views as a coach. So I want all my players to do their work early whether it's before practice or if you're only limited to two hours of practice as a coach, I'm going to put a, an emphasis that there's, you know, there's 10 to 15 minutes of, uh, you know, doing ABCs before you get into practice. Mm-hmm. You got it. And what would be essential skills for post players then? Would they be, uh, I already know that it will start with shooting. Yeah. See yeah. That? So, you know, I put in here shooting and touch and you can add touch to the, um, the guard one as well, but, um, bigs are a lot more closer to the basket, but in today's day and age, you know, the, you know, everybody wants to, the, the, the quote unquote stretch five. So if you're working with a young player, um, I, I want him to have three point range. You know, you, you don't, you don't see many people wanting the mid, the, the mid range shot. So I would tell a young player to, to work on the same things a guard does. You know, being in Europe, you know, this as well, that, you know, we, a lot of us in Europe, especially Serbia, you know, you teach, you teach the guards and the bigs pretty much the same thing. 
you know, from an early to a late age where they're almost interchangeable. And, um, I, you know, a lot of it goes hand in hand, but same thing with the bigs. I might change the bigs positioning. Um, when they're doing their, their activation, I may put them on the block and I may have them work on, okay, you got to do five front pivots. You got to do five reverse pivots with each, you know, but when I'm teaching post and this goes to the footwork, I always tell a player, when you catch the ball, you have four options before you put the ball on the floor. You can, you can pivot four different directions. Um, so I think that's important. And a lot of players today, you know, they don't work on their pivoting. And I mm -hmm. think pivoting is just as important as the shooting because, you know, it's creating space. And it's also, more importantly than anything, it's reading the defender. Uh, the defender is going to tell you where to go. And if, when a defender tells you where to go, it's a lot easier to score. You know, and back to the same thing, you know, when you go to the passing, um, you know, the big, okay, he's distributing, he's receiving the ball just as much as the guard is. And, you know, it's doing your work early. A lot of times, th this burns me up. We, a lot of us, um, we do the, the horn, whatever you want to call it, the, the horn sets, mm -hmm. where uh, the big start the elbows. And so often you see the, the post gets shoved out, like, back behind the three-point line. It's just a simple thing of, you know, get playing low. Um, getting your hit, getting, you know, playing lower than your defender, getting your forearm up, creating that separation on the catch and doing your work early. Uh, bigs have to catch the ball in different spots. And I think that's important with, um, you know, the receiving aspect for the big. Um, same thing with, um, with, you know, with distributing. Uh, you know, I've seen bigs jump when they pass, which, you know, burns me up. I think, I think, I think post players need to realize to, pass a lot of times with one or two hands, um, see the floor, see the reads. A lot of it might be, you know, we, we've worked on that escape dribble to, mm -hmm. a, to a pass. Um, you know, and I think, you know, I think, I think it's a lot, of, a lot of the big stuff. And I, I say this, I, you know, I tell coaches, how are your, where do you want your bigs to catch it? And what footwork do they want? You know, if, um, if I'm going through the trail and early offense, then I want to work with my, with my bigs. How do I want them catching it? Do I want them to catch it permanent pivot? Do I want them to catch it as a jump stop? Um, and, and work on that. And then what are the bigs reads? I mean, you know, if, if you have a, a quote unquote stretch five, um, you know, maybe he's thinking shot first, but if a big can't shoot it, okay, maybe he's going to go right into a swing the ball or he's going to go into a dribble handoff. So, um, you know, I think passing is important. And, um, you, know, it, you know, like I said, and, you know, I have here both distributing and receiving. Um, I didn't put ball handling here because, you know, we, we talked about three. I probably should have added four. But even teaching the dribble handoff, um, I've been in the CBA for the last two years, and I love the dribble handoff. Um, and with that being said, I see so often I'll see bigs do dribble handoffs outside the three-point line, and that burns me up. I, w I want a big seeking out the guy who's guarding the, the, the receiver. And, you know, I think – and, and if, the, if the guard – is worth anything who's receiving the ball, he's setting that guy up where that big coming downhill is going to, you know, is going to catch it in an area where he could, you know, where the guard can turn the corner and, and be a threat. So I think a lot of these things go hand in hand. I think just every coach has to determine where do they, where do they want their players catching the ball and working on those aspects. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's good to hear when you were talking about the footwork and pivoting, because I had experience, I think already, I think a year ago, uh, I was working with one of the players in VTB, and he didn't really utilize pivoting at all, and he was a post player, and so his career stats were like 3.5 points per game or something like that, and I didn't see him. I was only consulting him through the video, sending him video breakdowns, and within one month, his stats, his points per game got up to 11 or 10.5. And he didn't take more shots. His shot averages were pretty much the same. But the difference was, one, it was harder for the matchups to guard him because he already kind of looked uh, more aggressive, even though he wouldn't take the shots always. Maybe he would just gain extra space with the pivoting. And then he also said that, it's man, it's just giving me extra confidence. Yeah, no, I mean, that, like I said, that's, you know, it's huge stuff. And, you know, to go back up, I, I didn't talk about, but I think touch is really important. So, you know, I'm always, you know, we see the bigs now, there's, you know, we call it the short roll or the, you know, the, the, the window. But I always, you know, I'm, I'm always working on bigs and guards, for example, but I'm also working on, on catching the ball and getting up into a, 
you know, what, whatever you want to call it, a floater or a runner or, you know, a short arm push or so forth. But, but you know, like I said, if um, when bigs are used to going, you know, going downhill or setting, you know, set, you know, laying wood on somebody and opening up, you know, there's, there's a lot, you're leaving a lot of put, points on the table if you're not pivoting the right way or, or separating the score that well. So, um, you know, that goes back in a touch. But I think a lot of these things, they, they coincide with one another. But when you're working with – going back to the aspect when you're working with young players, I think this would be my checklist when I'm working. You know, if I, if I only have guys for 45 minutes or an hour, but I'm going to make sure that these three things are covered a majority of the time when it's, when it's individual. Mm -hmm. And watching, uh, watching practices all over the world, you, you've been basically, I want to say, six continents. If, Almost well, six. <laughs> five? Yeah, all, five. Yeah, so you've been pretty much everywhere. What do you think is the most underrated skill that either players don't spend enough time on or maybe coaches? Well, I'm going to go back here. And, I, you know, some coaches may disagree with me on this, but it's been, you know, I was – I was lucky to be in the NBA very early in my career. And then I went over to Australia and I don't know, player development, it's a widely used word now, but I was so lucky, you know, in, in my settings where I was in the NBA, where that pre-practice um, development was so key. And I felt like when I went overseas, I would see so much casual shooting before practice started. So the thing, you know, and a lot of a lot of the things I say tie to one another, but um, I always felt like, you know, it, you know, in my in my world, I feel like a player should already be ready when when practice starts. I, I almost think, in some regards, you could you should be you should already have a sweat going. You could be stretched out. Um, and like I said, if it, if it, done the right way, and it's all about what your culture is and what your focus on is. You know, I think to have, I think player development has to be a key because you can, if you're going to put in so many X's and O's in those two hours and offensive drills, defensive drills, zone drills, you sometimes forget just those simple things of like we're putting the ball on the floor, we're putting the ball in the hole. I mean, per, per se, and uh, I think that's important. I think a lot of times there's there's uh, we talk about it, but I don't know how much the emphasis is. And and I always, you know, I think the most successful programs there's you know, there's coaches, they have, you know, they have set times maybe before practice. It might be as something as small as, you know, 10, 15 minutes, and there's something worked in. You know, I, I would say there, there needs to be at least in a two-hour practice, I, would, I want at least 30 minutes of uh, player development, you know, skill, you know, skill specific. Um, and that goes in back to that, my next point, time management. Um, how much time do you have? You might only have two hours. Maybe the player doesn't have access to the court before. So that's where you talk about constraints. But I, I think getting the players better, um, you know, I don't care if it's youth basketball, high school basketball, college or pro, you know, players want to get better. And when players are working on their game, they're at their best. And, um, you know, like I said, I, you know, I think a lot of coaches, uh, the, time I, the time I feel like most practices nowadays – Coach, coaches are saying they don't want to go more than an hour and 15 minutes. So I think if you give yourself that hour 15 minute mark, it gives you 45 minutes to have a lot of player development, you know? So in the perfect, and for, to answer your question, you know, I think player development is the thing that's not widely talked about enough. It, it can't just be a 10 minute bigs guard segment in practice. It, it's, it's not enough. And, um, mm -hmm. and that goes, and that goes to my post-practice, you know, same thing, how much, you know, for me as an assistant coach, I post-practice is probably my favorite time sometimes because I want to squeeze everything I can out of a player. And I want him to get off the court feeling – I want him to feel pure joy. And I'm going to – you know, I call them finishers. I set, I set a, a number of different drills where a player has to – he has to complete these drills or – tasks before he can get off the court so I want him to have that level of uh self-fulfillment and joy when he's going off the court a, a player might have a really shitty practice but if you can grab him after practice and put him back in and and give him some some structure of development that's going to make him feel good before he goes and sits in the locker room and takes a shower you're doing more for that player than letting him walk off the court so I think post-practice development is just as important. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Hard not to agree with that because I still see some some players by the end of the practice, they just get the spot ups, spot up shots in pre practice too. And basically, okay, they get the volume to the shots, but but that's it. Yeah, no, and I, and I, and I the, the thing I've, I've realized, and, you know, I, I've, you know, and I, we're going to talk about this later in the challenges segment is sometimes, you know, sometimes as an assistant coach, um, you know, if you're working for somebody that's maybe a little bit more old school or so forth, that, you know, coaches are a little bit more looser after practice. A player can do what he wants, which is fine. But as, you know, as an assistant, I just think that, you know, that's sometimes our time to shine. You know, once you start creating it with, um, with some, you know, for me, when I'm in China, a lot of times I'm always in charge of the imports. But for mm -hmm. me, I'm, I'm grabbing everybody. You know, I, I'm grabbing maybe a bench player. I'm grabbing, a, you know, I'm grabbing a domestic player. I want, you know, I want energy. I think more players creates more energy. And mm -hmm. like I said, I, I, I want three or four guys, you know, working. Whether it's just spot shooting, maybe you don't want to burn out a player. Maybe it's just a bunch of spot shooting after practice. But um, I think a lot of times, you know, you got to, you know, you – us assistant coaches, you kind of got to, especially in the international game, you have to kind of create the player development culture yourself, whether it's before or after practice. Mm -hmm. And talking about self, self scouting, uh, how players can evaluate themselves in your opinion. Can you tell me what should be going in their head? If maybe they're watching film or just trying to figure out what, what needs to be done, what they need to work on. Uh, I mean, self-evaluation, it's a, you know, it's a wide ranging. Um, I would usually watch, I like to watch film with players. I know a lot of us don't have maybe the resources for that, but you know, what, what I've done a lot is I always like to sit down with my laptop and I usually have 10 to 20 clips to show a player. I call them good, bad, and the ugly. And um, mm -hmm. like I said, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this later with the, the negatives and so forth, but um, I want a player at first, I want to watch with him, but okay. as it goes on, um, I've been a part of some creative teams. When I was in Australia, we actually, there was a couple of times that we put players in positional groups and these players had to watch video and they had to pull their own clips for, they had to pull their own clips for, um, showing the rest of the group the next day. Um, and it, it was, it was a great exercise. We ended up winning. I mean, I'm not saying this is what did it, but the same group won a championship that season. But, um, I think the more you, you sit with them early, they start knowing when they're watching it by themselves, what they did, you know, right and wrong. Um, my next point, you know, which goes to your next question is I think players need to know all positions. Um, if a player only knows his position, he doesn't know where the other five guys are supposed to be on the court, it's hard to evaluate. You know, we know as coaches, when we watch, we immediately know if somebody's out of position. But I think that's important for, for players to know, you know, the, the, you know, the different positions. I mean, if, if I'm running my own five on all, I might have one day a week, I might put my center in the point guard spot. Mm -hmm. And I might, I might just make it a, a 10 minute experiment. But once you put that stress on the players thinking, what if coach puts me at, what if coach puts the, uh, my the four man at the uh, at, at the two, you know how are the, how is the players? But it puts that internal stress for the player to really study the game and, and and do the mental reps. Maybe maybe you have to give the players a playbook, a video playbook outside. But I like creating that. I, I challenge coaches have have one time a week where you set five ten minutes and you put a player outside of a position that they're supposed to be in and. Trust me, after you do that for three, four weeks, there's going to be a, there's going to be a change after that. You know? mm -hmm. It might be a, you know, it might look like the Keystone Cops to start. I mean, you know, you're going to see bodies and balls flying everywhere, but you're going to create that stress. Nobody wants to be embarrassed, but like I said, um, you know, and you put the, you know, you put the onus on the players that you know, they got to know all five spots. And once players know all five spots, I think, you know, as coaches, you know, we're going to be a lot, we're going to have a better product on the court. Mm -hmm. And talking about the goal setting, how would that process go? Uh, how many goals would you set per season or maybe per month? Um, you know, okay, you know, I put in season, off season. I'm going to draw back to mm – -hmm. I'm going to go back – draw back to my Australian days in the NBL. Um, we actually had game goals. And, um, you know, so I don't know – you know, do you want to talk about individual or team? Individual. Okay. So going back to individual um, for in season, 
you know, I just think as a coach, you need to figure out what's attainable. Um, you know, you can't, you know, and, and in season, you know, with goals, I'm probably going to, you know, I, I would like to have, I, I like the collegiate high school type things where, you know, you make it a, you know, a 500 club every week. A guy must make, you know, 500 threes as the week goes on pre-practice. You know, I like to chart things. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, this is really wide ranging when you talk about, you know, goals is you just have to figure out as a coach, you know, what, what are you stressing for the player individually? Um, you know, I don't like to say points per game. It's difficult. Um, mm -hmm. I think, I think getting to the free throw line for a player, we all know what players can get to the foul line, but I think getting to the foul line is important. That's something I've always stressed when I'm working with players individually is how many times you get to the free throw line a game uh, rebounds, you know, you know, uh, you know, it's bad, but you know, now even in the CBA this past year, I would, I would get on some of my guys about the rebounding numbers and you know, mm -hmm. I don't really like it, but we know what happens, you know, guys asking you after the first quarter, you know, how many rebounds he has and, you know, so forth. But, you know, you don't want players to get, um, you know, stat specific when you're setting goals. Mm -hmm. So I think you've got to be careful in setting individual goals. I, I like individual goals for, the off season for doing work, for getting shots up. Um, you know, I, you know, I, I think, you know, efficiency is the most important thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And how often would you give players heads up on, on their progress? Um, it depends at what level, you know, if you're in the high school or college level, I guess even Europe where you're playing only, you know, one or two times a week, I think you could do weekly. I think, okay. weekly's per, you know, I think weekly is pretty, you know, weekly is pretty um, easy, you know, in the, in the NBA, when you're playing, you know, four games in seven days, it's not really attainable. Um, mm -hmm. Or, you know, a, you, you know, if you're playing travel league circuit and it's, it's probably difficult too. you're playing a, a large raw number of games, um, you know, in a short amount of time, I don't know how, but mm -hmm. you know, I would just say, you know, you have to be, you have to figure out what's attainable and what's important when you're setting goals. Um, and like I said, I think individual goals have to be, you have to be careful. You know, I, I would, you know, I, I think it's more before practice and after practice. And the other thing is it, how many, you know, can you chart practice? You know, can you chart um, open shots? You know, can, can you chart, can you chart shots at the, in the paint? You know, how many paint touches are you getting per game? You know, all of us have different resources when it comes to that. So I don't really have a set, I don't really have a set, you know, goals for that. I think you have to sit down as a staff and you have to figure out, a, what's more important, and B, what's attainable for each and every player. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And talking about those pre-practice and post-practice workouts, or maybe even those quick 20 minutes workout, 20 minute workouts before game, in your opinion, what are the keys to make them as efficient as possible? You know, here I put, I put, you know, because you know, I, I had these questions ahead of time. With, like, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, when you talk about like, you know, whatever you want to call them, vitamins or you know, supplements. I know different, you know, different, I know, I know the Spurs kind of were the ones that first termed the, the word vitamins, which makes so much sense. But I think as a staff and, and as a player, you have to sit with the player and you have to identify, um, you know, the, the, the keys to uh, each of the players, you know, what's important, you know, how are they finishing? Uh, what's, what's the footwork? Um, and, and I think, you know, it's, you know, I think, I think it's, it's, it's being, you know, it's being specific when it comes to that. And, um, you know, it, it's, I, I think the structure is very important to like how you make it. I, I like, you know, it sounds like it's something you probably work on because you, know, you talk about 20 minutes, but you no, know, I think that's perfect. If you have 15, 20 minutes before practice, um, you know, what is it? Is it, is it touch shots? Is it shots off the dribble? Is it, is it some passing? But I think you have to sit with the staff. And you have to figure out four to five things per, per player that you want, that they need to work on for their game within the offense. And then mm -hmm. I think, I think it's, um, you know, you need to also sit with the player and you need to get buy-in from the player and figure out, you know, what makes the player happy. You can't give him four or five things that he doesn't like, otherwise you're not going to have the buy-in. Um, mm -hmm. The next thing, and I think this is probably the most important is specific to the player. Um, you know, you can't have five guards or five forwards or five bigs all working on the same vitamins always. Some guys are more athletic. 
some guys have higher skill, some guys have lower skill. So I think it has to be player specific. Um, you know, when it comes to creating the, you know, the right vitamins for each and every player, you know, some of us are vitamin deficient in something. So if you're deficient mm -hmm. in something, you know, that's something you have to add before you get to practice. And most, most people who are watching this that, you know, at the NBA level, the G League level, they, you know, th this has been talked about for the last, you know, 10 years, pretty, pretty, uh, you know, pretty observably. And um, I think now internationally, you just got to figure out, you know, what's most important to um, that player, you know, create the structure of how you're going to, you know, give each player their vitamins. And then you have to get specific. What are the specific vitamins each and every player needs? Mm -hmm. I love that idea about vitamin deficient because that's, I mean, it's right on point and doesn't matter what your opinion is on this. When you get that life example, which is not, not about basketball at all, you can really see the connection between just your life in general and how it can be translated to what you do on court too. Mm -hmm. Totally. And so the next thing I wanted to ask was about the video breakdown. And when, when showing videos to, to players individually, how long would you want to make the clips in order just to make sure that they pay attention through the whole clip? You know, I, I think you just have to create a rule in your head. You know, is it, is okay. it, you know, for me, it's sometimes it's no more than five minutes or it's no more than 20 clips. So, um, you know, certain players are different ways. You know, I, I've, you know, I, I've, I've been blessed to be with, with some players at a, at a high level that they wanted to watch everything, you know? So, you know, you have guys asking for their game right after they're done and they've already watched it twice before you even sit down with them. So mm -hmm. I think that the, the key things are, you know, finding no more than 20 clips or whatever mix that has to be offensively or defensively that are best pertaining to it. And you don't need to have five of the same thing. You know, maybe you have, um, the best way to teach sometimes is to show one, you know, one negative example and then maybe two positive examples mm -hmm. or maybe two negative with one positive. Um, you know, I, I get that, I get down there on, on that when I talk about the 50, 50 or 75, 25 mm -hmm. rule, but I think individually you just have to figure out how you have to teach it. Um, I started in the video room in the NBA and I feel like I, my, my edits when I first started were really, really long and I felt like they were redundant. And as time went on, I realized, like, um, short and simple was the most important. And then when you get to the point, you know, it's – you might be able to send a player five clips the night before practice, and they've watched those five clips before you sit down with them, and they get that mental rep. They might not even know what you're showing them. Maybe I send them those 20 clips the night before. With technology now, you have so much at your disposal. It's easy to send a player 20 clips. Maybe it took him – three, four minutes to watch it before he went to bed. And then when you sit down with him the next day at, at 9, 10 o'clock a.m., you know, he, he's seen those 20 clips, and then you're watching and teaching. So, you know, my, my thing with that would be, you know, like I said, I think no more than five minutes and no more than 20 clips, mm -hmm. either or. Mm -hmm. And would that be different? Uh, would that be different types of videos that you would show pregame or on a practice day, maybe like less negatives pregame? Yeah, uh, pregame, pre um, I'm all positive pregame. I, oh. I, I am 100% positive. I want, I want guys to be – I want guys to feel good about themselves. Um, I want them to be confident. So if I'm telling a guy I want, you know, you need to, you know, you need to attack, attack going left. You need to attack getting to the paint. Mm -hmm. um, you know, see the shot before the pass. You know, I'm going to show him, you know, two or three examples of all positive engagement. Um, I'm not going to show any negative. Um, to, to show another setting, there was one of my years in Australia, my coach gave me a lot, of, you know, he empowered me pretty strong. I was able to show a video before every game, and I should basically show two or three minutes of all positive clips before the team took the court. And I loved it. You know, the next time I have my own team, like, I will 100% do that. But I wanted the players – I didn't want them to worry about the other team. I wanted them to worry about themselves. So I would find good examples of what, whatever we were trying to stress home, whether it was gang rebounding, um, transition defense, um, rebounding and running, 
you know, um, paint, tu- you know, paint touches, um, second chance points. But I would show, like I said, I'd show two or three minutes of all positive, uplifting basketball, almost like a pump up or a highlight video. But it's gonna be a little bit more teaching specific. So um, that's important. And then, like I said, post game, it's post game, it's easy. You know, you want to correct. You know, mm-hmm. you want to, um, you know, you want to identify. You want to correct. You know, and then, you know, like I say, hopefully you have a positive example you could show from previously in the season. Mm-hmm. You know, um, if you have the right staff in place, you're always going to have positive examples to go back to to show. Um, a lot of people, I know in the NBA and the college level, you have that, that virtual playbook that you keep going back to. And like I said, that's important. Mm-hmm. You know, whether it's a cracking back on defense or, you know, you know, excellent examples of pick and roll coverages. You, you have to have those positive examples to the player. You can show the player where they did it right, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if you don't mind asking, what's, what are you like teaching the most on the court? Uh, what am I teaching the most? Great, great question. You know, I put it here, my passion in teaching. Uh, you know, I, I added a third, but first and foremost, it's footwork and finishing. You know, early in my career, I was able to work with Tim Grover right out of college. And you know, he's, a, you know, people know him because he, he's worked with uh, Michael, Kobe, Dwayne Wade, Hakeem, and a lot of guys. So a lot of what I learned young was a lot of um, basic footwork, advanced footwork, and finishing. And, you know, when I went to Australia and I started working with younger levels of kids on the side, I realized a lot of kids didn't, you know, finishing was just finishing. They would just, you know, they would just shoot, you know, they shoot a layup. And I think footwork and finishing go hand in hand. There's so many, there's so many different, uh, you know, footwork or finishing moves you can do. I have a, I have something I've expanded on because I, you know, I kind of come from my, my, one of my first, um, coaches I worked for was Brian Gregory at Dayton. And then I literally left Brian Gregory at Dayton and worked for Scott Skiles in Chicago. And it was mm-hmm. funny. I was actually working for two players who both started under uh, Judd Heathcote. And mm-hmm. they both had variations of a drill called the daily dozen. And Every day you would do six finishes from the left and six finishes from the right. Um, it'd be various footwork. It might be underhand, overhand, <laughs> um, reverse, but I started getting more um, advanced with it. I would teach spin move when you're attacking middle. I would teach up and under. I would teach a step back. I might teach a Euro step. Um, I might teach, I call it to Dwayne Wade, when you're, when you're attacking downhill, one dire- you know, and then you jump, you do, a, mm-hmm. you do a jump stop on the other direction. But um, I think footwork and finishing go hand in hand. So, you know, whether it's before practice or after, after practice, you know, I like to get into that. And the other players, you have to realize when you're teaching footwork and finishing, what's, what's a player able to do? You know, uh, is a, a big guy who's 250 pounds, is he able, you know, do you really want him working on a Euro step? You know, you have to see what, um, what his athleticism and skill set can handle mm-hmm. and what he can expand on. And this goes back to um, – when you have to identify goal setting and so forth, you know, what, what can this, what is this player's skill and athleticism? What does it translate to? And that goes back to the vitamins, you know? So mm-hmm. I think yeah. footwork and finishing, that's my passion. And I added a third and that's the precision shooting. And now when I'm doing shooting drills, I call them, you know, a lot of times after practice, I call them finishers. I'm always setting goals. Um, you know, I've seen sometimes when we're work, when I has been with the Serbian national team, we make every guy on the court he has to make ten in a row from three, from five spots before he goes home. So it sounds tough, but once you make it a you make it a weekly you know priority and commitment, it it you know it it, it creates you know better better habits and you know better better results. Yep. And I, ha- I basically have two more questions. Uh, just going back to your whole coaching career, what was the biggest challenge that you have faced? And uh, what did you do in order to get through it? A challenge, you know, ch- challenges here, they all kind of um, coincide with one another for me. It's been on the skill levels and adaptability. I've went from, I've been blessed because early on, I, you know, I worked for Division I program at, at Indiana um, as a student manager. But then as my career has grown, I've been, I've been grassroots AAU. I've been junior college. 
I've been Division One. I've been minor league. I've been NBA. I've been FIBA, and I've been Australia and, and Asia. So I've been at so many different levels that my challenges sometimes are sometimes you have to scale it back just because you come from the NBA and you go to Australia, you're dealing with a different skill set. So mm -hmm. you have to go up and down. It, a funny example this year was, you know, I was with, um, you know, I, I was with Serbia this past year in the world championships where we were playing at a really extremely high level for two months of, of practicing and playing. And all of a sudden I went back to my, you know, my Chinese team and my head coach who, uh, you know, he was Spanish. Um, he said to me, he says, Hey, you need to, uh, you know, you need to drop in a couple of levels of, of your coaching because you're dealing with different players. And it, it was actually great. I was so used to this high, high level that I had to adapt, you know? So I think that's, that's been important. And communications, um, you know, and then uh, before I go to communication, adaptability also is every setting you go in is different. You're dealing, you know, I've worked for a lot of different coaches from different levels and the way they see the game might not be how you see it. And at an international level, it's different. You know, I've, I've went to Australia and worked for several coaches. I went to Asia, I worked for several coaches. So you have to see, you know, what do they see the game like you do? And just because you come from maybe a higher level, you have to adapt to what that coach wants. It's the most important thing is developing that, that trust, which goes back into the communication. You know, I think communication – when I put this in front of challenges, it's, it's, it's working with the players and it's working with the staff. And um, I think it's important in China. One of the most toughest parts is the language barrier. You might have one translator, you might have two. And I've been in positions where maybe I didn't have a translator for practice or so forth. So a couple of times I was pretty frustrated, but you just start realizing you, you have to, um, you know, I have a teaching background. That's what my, my degree's in and, and a master's degree in educational leadership. So I always, communications, you know, it, it's key. And you, you create that connection with your team and how you communicate. And that's been my big thing. Like I said, I think me, I've jumped around to so many different levels that I have went up and down. I've had to adapt. And mm -hmm. you really have to have great communication skills with the people you're working under, the people you're working with, and most importantly, your communication with the players. Mm -hmm, got it. And before I ask the last question that I have, I just wanted to say to all the listeners who are here, you're more than welcome to type your questions in the chat, or if you want to ask it live, I can unmute you. That, that should be good too. So my, my last one that I wanted to ask was, um, what advice would you give to younger self, maybe when you were just started in coaching? Um, younger, younger advice, uh, you know, the, the thing I, I you know, I, that's actually a great question. I thought about this one a lot when you, when you, when you, when you wrote it to me, but yeah. in terms of, you know, in, in terms of advice, um, you know, <sighs> that's a great question. You got me stumped right now as you're, as you're on this, but in terms of advice, I've been, I've been to so many different, you know, I've been to so many different levels. You know, I think, um, I think it's just patience in the process, you know, and it's one thing I actually always thought about is I always wanted to, I always wanted to crawl before I could walk. And I always wanted to, you know, walk before I could jog. I wanted to jog before I could run. And I think a lot of times as coaches, we put this pressure to get to this high, high level of, of the game. And I think it's really, really important to, to understand the, you know, the younger levels and the, and the other levels of it. And I was blessed. You know, I was in the NBA, like, by my second or third year out of college. But um, I was actually – I, I kind of went backwards in a way by design. But I always wanted to learn more about Europe. And I've been blessed the last three, four summers to really dive into European basketball, almost where I, I – I love the teaching aspect, sometimes even more so than the NBA, where – I'm able to sit with coaches at all levels. I mean, I'm lucky. I'm in a, a basketball background of Belgrade, which is, you know, excellent. But I've been blessed to be around good coaches my whole life. And I just think, you know, you need to learn from the ground up, you know, before you start, you know, trying to sprint in this profession. So, 
you know, it's the same thing. I, I, I was on one of these a couple of days ago. I, I always tell younger coaches or even coaches that are, you know, I'm not that old. I'm, in, I'm in, you know, I'm in my early 40s that I always tell coaches that go sit and watch a youth practice in some place you've never been. Go sit and watch a girls practice. Um, there's always something to learn. So, um, you know, whether it's sitting here on a webinar or, or going and finding a really good D2 or NAI program, there's always something to be learned. And like I said, don't be, you know, s spend time on the details, the lower levels before you try to accentuate your, uh, your career path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hard not to agree with that. There's always ways to improve. And we're ready to get the first question. So uh, that's from a player. How, in your opinion, players are better able to cope with stress, for example, before the games? I think the most important thing for coping with stress is um, it's, it's be, I mean, first of all, it's being able to focus. But I think you've got to have, you, you've got to have your pregame ritual. You know, what's your, what's your you know, what, what, what are you, what's your preparation habits? Um, I, I teach all players to have a routine. This is important. Um, I don't know what level of the player that asked me that is, but I don't care whether you're in high school, you're college or NBA, have, have a routine, whether it's um, maybe, you, you know, you got to go from your, you know, the minute you leave practice to the minute you get to the game, to the minute you're sitting in your locker room, is it listening to music? Is it maybe doing some, some yoga or is it doing some meditation maybe it's watching some video with a coach but i think the most important thing sometimes is is getting that daily routine will allow your mind to ease when you go into the game because the preparation is already done once you get that routine in it will make things much much easier and in turn the player will be more confident as the, as the games pile up mm -hmm. and i think about two days ago uh, i had a talk with uh, Henry Darmacon, the former EuroLeague player and now the assistant coach for Windy City. And he was talking about the same thing. And he also added that he used to visualize when he was sitting in the locker room before, before the game starts, that he vis visualizes the first possession, who gets the ball, how he's defending somebody or what he's doing on offense, how he's scoring the first points. And it was helping him to kind of calm himself down and increase the confidence no i mean that like i said he's and he's one of the you know he, i mean he was i think he was you know he, he he used to pilot points in europe and no that's a that's an excellent 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 example because like i said i think all players i mean so i've been you know i've been blessed to be in the nba for many many years so you know you see players on a daily basis everybody has their own has their own pregame routine whether it's what time they're getting to the gym what time they're putting their socks on, um, you know, what time they're getting taped, what time they enter the court. And like I said, I think, I think the key is routine. Um, the, visual, the visualization stuff is, you know, that, you know I, I think that stuff's beautiful. If you, you know, as a coach, I've always tried to work with players on, on getting their habits um, correct. I, I actually worked with an import several years ago overseas that he was a younger player. And I feel like he didn't have any type of routine. I, I almost walked him through it. I actually would pick him up every morning for, for breakfast. We would go sit and have breakfast at a restaurant. We would talk about the game. And I try to set forth some examples holding his hand. But before you knew it, he had it down. And, you know, mm -hmm. he ended up having a really successful year. But sometimes as coaches, you know, we have to put these players in the, in the best positions to succeed. That's not just in the game. That's, that's all aspects of the game. That's on and off the court. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I think George Rivlin said, said that uh, the job of a coach is to take the player where he can't go by himself. And that's what you just described. And there's one more question. Um, how do you prefer to teach floaters? Is it more of a push or like a normal jump shot? Another great question. Um, I, the, I actually, I stole this. I, I listened to a podcast recently. This is the best way taught. You know, somebody said, you know, you don't want, you know, you don't want to break, you, you don't want to break into a full, in a, into a full follow through. Mm -hmm. But I think everybody is different. I will usually tell players, I don't care if you want to call it a runner or a floater, but I always, or do you want to go off of one foot or two feet? Me personally, I like going off of one foot, but I've seen co players that like to go off two. Um, 
But in terms of, you know, your question of, of like how to work on a floater, you know, you got to give yourself arc. And I think the most important thing is touch. You know, mm-hmm. it, it's, 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 you know, seeing that, you know, you don't want to break, you're not going into a full follow through, you know? So if you're going into a full follow through, it's probably not a true floater, you know? Mm-hmm. Okay. Got it. And I received one question private. Uh, so one second. Uh, so what do you think are the ways for international coaches to start working in the NBA or, or G League? What do you think needs to be done from them? Well, yeah, that's, a, that's another great question. Um, you, you know, the way the, the game is truly a global game now that I think you, you must be passionate at what you're doing and you have to, you know, I always tell people my own start, you know, I didn't play at a high level. I played a few years NAIA and then I transferred to division one to be a student manager. That's how I got my start in this business. But I was actually back then I was using fax machines and emails and so forth. I would, I would send a, a cold email or a fax to you know, random people in the world and, you know, and hope, you know, you send out, you send out 10, maybe you get one response, but you know, you have to, um, you can't be scared to ask for help. And, you know, you see somebody sitting on, you know, you know, I'm here in Belgrade. I'm, I'm blessed. Sometimes I, I'm, I'm walking down the street and I might see a, a coach that I've never met. And my personality sometimes is just go tap somebody on the shoulder and you ask them, they got five minutes and maybe you're just talking about basketball, but I don't really have a, you know, I don't for, I grew up in the States, so I don't have the best um, answer for that because I was very lucky. I was, I was at Indiana university and went to a final four my junior year. So I was at a really, really high level of basketball with NBA players and scouts coming in and out of the doors for many years. And I was actually, I was coaching high level AAU before I was in, while I was in college, the rules were a little different then, but I would just tell international coaches just, keep doing what they're doing. I think these webinars have been excellent. I see so many coaches now, they're studying, you know, international playbooks. They're sharing it on Twitter and Instagram. Mm-hmm. I think all that stuff's excellent. And they're trying to, you know, you have to meet people directly at the end of the day. And like I said, you know, you know, whether you have to, if, if the G League or the NBA is your goal, you got to put yourself in that position, whether it's a internship or, you know, like I said, you, you got to be willing to crawl through dirt sometimes in order to, um, to get up and walk. So, you got to try to put yourself in that position. Everybody's, you know, everybody's in a different, different boat, but you know, you know, coach, be passionate what you do. And like I said, you got to be persistent. I think passion and persistence are the two most important things to aspire in this, posi- in this profession. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And can't, can't agree more because without that, it, it will be even harder. And there's one more from the same player that asked the first two questions. Uh, can you recommend some books? They don't have to be about basketball. Maybe something about uh, mindfulness and mental training. Um, mindfulness, mental training. I'm gonna. I have to look at my cell phone because I want to get the name right. But um, give me one second, real quick. Mm-hmm. I would say the best mindful book is the Inner Game of Tennis. Okay. Yeah, that's um, great. Um, a lot of us coaches now have read about it because Pete Carroll from the Seahawks NFL football made it, made it really popular. And you hear, you know, you hear coaches like Steve Kerr talking about it now, but um, I'm, I'm a huge uh, NFL football fan. And even early back in college, I absolutely loved reading football biography books of coaches because the, the level of detail was intense. And um, so I really developed a huge passion for that. I've even, um, this is another thing I challenge guys. This goes back to the other question you had about how you break in. I, a lot of times utilize where I am in the world to take advantage of it. So, you know, um, I'll give you an example. If, if, uh, if I'm in, if I was ever up in Seattle, I've met some people with the Seattle Seahawks coaching staff. I would ask, can I come to a day of OTAs or so forth? And like I said, I, I think, um, you know, read, read books of great leaders, whether it's sporting or so forth. But back, you know, I'm, I'm kind of jumping around in this answer because I, I kind of got talking about the inner game of tennis, but it's a great book. And it really has not, you know, it has to do about sports and life as much as it does tennis. But that's mm-hmm. the first book I would read. And 
you know, Steve Kerr talks about it in a, in a podcast that's on the uh, internet right now. He says that he read the book two or three times during his playing career. And you're talking about one of the you know, greatest shooters of all time. So that should tell, if that doesn't tell you enough, um, you know, it should tell you something. So Inner Game of Tennis would be the first book I would tell you to read um, with that. Another book to read, I think, would be Tim Grover's book, you know, mm -hmm. um, that, that he recently wrote. You know, that's another, another great example for that. Yeah, well, I think I went through Tim Grover's book, I don't know, maybe like five times or something like that. But every time I go through it, I always find something new for myself. Yeah, a lot of times, you know, like I said, a lot of times when you're reading books, you read and you take the notes. We're a little bit spoiled now because with the, with the Kindle and iBooks, you can kind of take the notes yourself. Right now, I always read everything in Kindle form and I copy it with the, with the color and then I send, it to my, I send it to my iPhone. So I constantly have it. But you know, I think the notes is important. And like you said, you know, there's, just because you read a book five years ago doesn't mean it retains. Sometimes mm -hmm. dusting that book off and rereading it could, be, could, could do, uh, do wonders for you. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. You're, you're hitting on point again on, on the notes. Well, uh, I wanted to thank you for finding the time to do it. The last thing I wanted to ask, uh, how people can reach out to you if they have any questions? Uh, pretty simple. Uh, it's my full name at Outlook.com. So it's Adam Salvage at Outlook.com. Um, I'll try to answer people back as, as, as easy as I can. But I love sharing the game and growing the game. And that's one thing I've, I've always prided myself on is for, you know, for people, don't be scared to, um, to reach out to somebody, whether, whether it's a, uh, you know, phone call is probably tough because, you know, you're getting unknown calls. But send me an email at Adam Tatalovich, you know, you know, all together at outlook.com and I'll do my best to answer that. Yeah, I just typed it in, in, in the comment section just so people can see it. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for finding the time and for the people who may missed it or who want to rewatch it, we'll be saving it and then we'll upload it to YouTube later and you should receive the links if you register for this, for this conversation. Well, Adam, thank you again and have a great day. I appreciate you having me, thank you.